Everyone has one chore that just gets old. They just get tired of. If you ask my wife what that one chore is for her, it'd be washing the clothes, doing the laundry. There's no joy in completing it for her because there's always more to do. Right? For her, there's this uh, moment, and I, I didn't realize this moment existed until I was asking her about it. There's this moment, this brief and shining moment when all the laundry in the, in the house is done. When everything is washed, everything is clean, everything is folded, everything is put away, and uh, the laundry is finished. And then at the end of the day, when you're getting ready for bed, there's this moment where you, you get changed in your pajamas and you take the, the clothes which are now dirty from the day, and you put them in the, in the laundry, in the hamper. And that's that moment, right? There is now laundry to do. You now, you're now behind again. It's never ending. There's always more laundry to be doing. It's always more water to be used, more water to clean, more water to, to use, because there's always more laundry. Water can be used another way. For another domestic activity, one that I think I enjoy uh, as much as Olivia, my wife, hates doing the laundry, you can use laundry to cook. you can use water to cook, and, and what I'm specifically thinking of is boiling taters. Right? Boiling taters. You, once you boil a tater, right, you have done something. It makes a permanent change, and I think that's the difference between using water to do laundry and doing water to boil using water to boil taters. When you wash clothes you're always going to have to wash them again. You're always going to have to use more water again and again and again. But once you've boiled that tater, that's it. That permanent change. It's never going to go back. It will never be what it once was. It's a permanent change. I believe that baptism is more like boiling a tater. It's a permanent change. You don't have to go back and get washed again and again and again. Once you're baptized, that's it. Tater's cooked. Permanent change. I find myself thinking about this, the way the nature that water is used to make a permanent change. As I was thinking about the nature of baptism, I was thinking about uh, this moment in Scripture when a permanent change occurs. You see, there's this moment in Scripture when the Hebrews become the Jews. There's a moment there. And if you follow along, the moment involves water. Let's back up and let's, let's if you go back to the beginning of uh, the story of the Hebrew people, the ethnicity known as the Hebrews, it starts with Abraham, who is traveling west and he has a family. And Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has a whole passel of kids. He's got 12 sons, and each one of those sons have a lot more sons and a lot more children as well. And so you go from a family, now you are 12 sons, now you have tribes. And when you get to the point where you have tribes, you're getting big enough that you are a people. In Greek, the term is ethnos, a people, which is where we get the term ethnicity. And uh, this Hebrew ethnicity is, is the people who go to Egypt, and they're under the protection of Joseph during the famine. And uh, they are then enslaved once a pharaoh rises up who does not remember Joseph. And then the, the, um, Moses comes and frees the Hebrew people, and he is freeing an ethnic group. He is freeing the Hebrews. And then... Uh, Moses leads them across the desert, and they get to the edge of the promised land, and, and Moses dies. And the person who's going to lead them into the promised land is named Yeshua, which is translated out of the Hebrew and into, the, into English as Joshua. And Joshua takes the people to the edge of the promised land and says, this is it. We're going to go into the promised land, and this is a decision you're making. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's where that phrase comes from, this moment when Joshua is going to lead the people. He's going to lead them through the River Jordan. And he leads them through the River Jordan, and every individual person of the Hebrew ethnicity, they have to decide, am I going to walk through this, this river, this River Jordan? And as they individually decide, they show up on the other side of the river, and that's it. They're Jews. You can call them Jews now. The Hebrew ethnicity, the Hebrew people in the promised land, now they're Jews. That's when you can call them properly, so to, so to speak. That's the moment when the tater gets cooked. Now, down the road a bit, another person, also named Yeshua, in this case, Yeshua is going to be translated, it's in the New Testament, so Yeshua is going to be translated out of the, uh, into English as Jesus, but still it's the same root name, Yeshua. And uh, there's going to be another fellow named Yeshua, 
and he leads people to the river Jordan and he goes down into the water and he, as he comes up out of the water the spirit descends, he goes off begins his ministry and, and calls people to follow him this is the moment when uh, Jesus' ministry begins and this is the moment when those who choose to follow Jesus that's when they, they become followers of Jesus they become disciples of Jesus that's when the tater gets cooked so to speak now the thing about boiling taters is you never do just one. I cannot think of a time, I cannot think of a, t a person who's ever boiled just one tater. No matter how big that tater is, you always boil multiple taters. Because the reason you boil taters is to mash them, and, and one tater would not make many mashed taters. Right? So in the same way, baptism is something that happens to individuals but it has a communal aspect to it, a corporate aspect to it. Baptism is an individual decisions, an individual person's decision to follow Jesus. Or in the case of infants, it's the individual it's a decision of these parents to raise this individual into the faith they already profess and practice. Just like each individual Hebrew had to choose whether or not to cross the river Jordan, just like each disciple of Jesus had to choose whether to follow him or not, that these are individual choices that are made, but everything that follows from that individual decision is communal. Because Jesus is always leading disciples, plural. Jesus is always leading a flock, a whole lot of, pe lot of people, right? Jesus, following Jesus is a team sport. It's an individual decision to join the team, but the work of salvation is worked out among disciples. Salvation is at its core a communal activity. For salvation it is a relational thing. Salvation is getting right with God and getting right with neighbors. And to get right with God and to get right with neighbors is a relational sort of communal thing. Boiling a tater changes it forever, and no one boils just one tater. Right. A pastor who is a few, year older, a few years older than me and far wiser, a fellow by the name of Reverend Jason McKelly, wrote about baptism. And part of this, what he uh, writes, is why I'm thinking about it the way I am, because he writes a letter to the church that's about to boil the tater, right? He's about to baptize his son. He writes this letter to the church and he says, Be warned. It's all cuteness and lace now, but in no time, my little baby boy, after a brief sojourn in childhood, will hit adolescence. His hormones will kick in and will quickly conspire to undo all the good you've done in him. These will be the years that he'll push you, church. He'll suddenly wonder how Jonah could survive that dark trip in the whale's belly. He'll argue that David may have bested Goliath, but he's no match for Tom Brady. Besides, David's hardly the unblemished hero his Sunday school teachers made him out to be. Proud of himself, he'll point out that Noah never would have had to build the ark if God had not decided to flood everything and everyone in the world. He'll push you, and if you're not up to the challenge, he'll be tempted to conclude that everything you've taught him and everything you teach is at best a fairy tale and at worst a lie. And this might be the first time that someone he knows or loves dies. And when that happens, church, you better not resort to, resort to cliches. You better be prepared to show him resurrection of the body, hope, among you. You may as well get ready now, because when those years arrive, you will have to struggle just to have your voice heard above all the callings that claim his attention and tempt his loyalty. Just one time seems to race by for his parents, tomorrow will seem forever away to him. Everything from the face he sees in the morning mirror to the fickle loyalties of his friends will change almost every day. And whether he knows it or not, church, what he will need from you all is a community of constancy. He will need a people who will refuse to let go of him, who refuse to let go of what they know to be true and enduring, who refuse to let him slip away before he learns to describe his world with the language you speak. And he'll never admit it to you, church, but what he'll need in those years is a place where he need not wear a mask, a place where vulnerability isn't a dirty word, a place where a life of mercy and love and gratitude is a viable and even compelling narrative. And then he'll start high school. You only have four years of Sundays left with him, and be warned, it will be harder for you to get his attention because he'll no longer be listening to your words. He'll be looking at your life. Scary, right? 
When he worships with you, he'll wonder if you're as friendly as you think you are. He'll wonder if you, are, if you ever experience awe and mystery or whether you're just ticking off your weekly obligation and hoping it won't be too boring. He'll wonder if you're loose and free enough to allow the Spirit to enter your worship and your lives. He'll look at your life, church, and he'll question whether you conform your views and values to the God of Jesus Christ or whether you've sketched an idol in your own unthreatening image. He probably won't put it in those words, or any words at all for that matter, but trust me, he'll be thinking it. In these years, his BS radar will be so acute, you better not patronize him, church. You have a tendency to do that when a young person puts you on your heels by asking questions. You better learn how to treat him as a body of the me- member of the body of Christ. This may be the last time you have his attention, so for his sake, I hope you lead a life that leads to the gospel. And I pray that just when he's being pressured and pursued to get ahead, to pursue his future, to achieve success and grab after his dreams, by then you will have taught him that the servanthood, that servanthood is the only path that leads to treasure. A place where he'll find the Lamb of God in your flesh. A place where he'll discover the coming kingdom previewed in your lives. A place where he'll learn that God is to be found among the lame and the poor and the outcast. Not because you tell him, but because you, church, invite him to come and see for himself. There'll come a time, there always does, when my boy will look desperately for where the living God can be found. When that time does come, church, I hope he will find a community who won't just shrug their shoulders, who won't refer him to the pastor, who won't quote the Bible at him or try to prove anything to him. Don't you dare do that to him, church. Instead, you better be able, because of the integrity of your life, to say to him, come and see. Church, that's the sort of church I would want to give my life to, so I'm willing to bet he'd give his life to it, too. In closing, church, before the water hits my baby's head, I hope the irony will have hit you upside yours. My boy will never be able to live out his baptism if you, church, don't live out yours. Sincerely, a concerned parent. Reading that letter got me thinking further about the nature of baptism. Right? Not just that no one boils just one tater, right? but also the fact that... Uh, We are all connected to children somehow, but we don't tend to get involved with children on behalf of the church speaking about and sharing our faith. And I thought about this, and uh, I'm not surprised. It's not part of how our culture uh, shapes us. It's not part of our our church practice for the last generations. But I mean, I look back across my childhood, and I had mentors in scouting, great scoutmasters. I had people to look up to in band, band parents, uh, leaders in band. But there was no one from the church that I talked to about my faith, ever. There was no other, no parents in the church, no leaders in the church with whom I talked about my faith. It really just never happened. And so I ask you to think about what children are you connected to? What children are you connected to that don't drive yet? Right? You are, somehow, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews, cousins, neighbors, kids. Everyone is connected to children somehow, somewhere, whether it's on a daily basis or whether it's only once or twice a year at the holidays. Everyone is connected to multiple children somewhere. And that child is not going to become a disciple of Jesus Christ by accident. That child needs you to live out your baptism so that they can understand theirs. And I'm guessing that since you are here this morning, that you are staking your life to some degree on Jesus. That following him, you find peace and joy and purpose in this life and hope for the life to come. That at a fundamental level, you believe what we say here as truth, as a capital T. You are here because your tater's been boiled. And we need to help those who are younger understand what that means. Practice their faith on an individual level. Right? Pray. Do you pray with the children who are in your life, whether it's learning the Lord's Prayer to pray before you have a meal whenever the grandkids come to your house? Or if they're older, would it look like writing the Thanksgiving prayer before the Thanksgiving meal, sitting down with all the kids and saying, okay, what do we want to give thanks for this year and to whom do we give thanks? Read. Whenever children are in your houses, can part of your practice be, after dinner, it's time to read a story out of the Bible because I can't wait to read this with you. If they're younger, they'll be excited to read a story with their, their, someone they look up to. And if they're older, you can tell them the truth. 
I love this story and I want to share it with you, or I don't understand this story and let's figure out why it matters. Right? It's going to be one of those two, and older children will enjoy the honesty of it, the ability to just ask questions and, and struggle together. <clears throat> Go out and serve together. Go out to a food pantry, and if, they're, if children are young, they'll be happy just to run around in circles and, and carry bags of noodles. And if they're older, they'll begin to ask those questions. Why do we see the same people here every month? And you can sit down and try to find answers. Maybe you find them, maybe you don't. Right? But if children are younger, they just want to spend time with you. And if they're older, they want to spend, find someone with whom they can be real, with whom they can be authentic, with whom they can be honest. All right, you tell the story of David to a young person, they're in awe of how cool David is. You tell the story of David to someone who's older, you can talk about how can David be the beloved king when that whole Bathsheba thing went down. What's that mean? Right? <clears throat> Don't try to reduce it to morals and truths. Just, just grapple with stories together. Another pastor, uh, Rich Fine is the fellow's name, who reminded me something important about working with children. Whatever you do matters. Right? If you think it matters, show it, and then they will follow along as well. It's the best thing you're doing that day, and you're just excited to share it with them. Now, I would not be surprised if what I'm describing makes you nervous. It makes me nervous as well. What I'm describing is not the practice of how I was raised, and I'm asking you to do what I'm trying to do myself, change the course of how my family raises children. Right? And that's a challenge. It is a challenge. It does not come naturally. I have my own hang-ups about this as well. Right? This is not how I was raised. But it's important. So it's time to do it. It's time to do what need be done. Right? And I wish I could wiggle out of this. I wish I could join with so many in the church who say, you know what, we'll just let the people in the church do this with our children. Because you know we have some people here in this church that are great with children. They're wonderful with children. And they can only be with the children once a week, if that. And what children need, if they're going to understand what it means for that tater to get cooked, is they need more interaction with just, than just once a week, if that. Whenever you, you are with the children that you love so dearly, that's an opportunity to connect with them and to walk and to share your faith with them in a way that matters. Right? Experiment, try something, take a swing at it. It is a need. And often I invite us to try something, I suggest things, but, but I can't do that today. This is not a suggestion. This is a need. We need to do this. Children do not become disciples of Jesus by accident. And if they do not become disciples, well, this is not just a matter of whether they'll grow up to be good citizens. This is a matter of salvation. And so what are you going to do? That's the question I want to leave you with today. What are you going to do? I'm reading a biography of FDR right now. And FDR's theory of how to make a difference boiled down to try something. And then if it doesn't work, try something else. But for whatever you do, try something. That's how, when asked what he was doing, that's how he explained it. You try something. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, try something else. But just try something. Just take a swing, figure out something you can start, and if it works with the children that you are honored and blessed to have a connection with, great. And if it just doesn't work, try something else. Change the course of your family. Change the course of how your family treats and raises children. Practice your faith together. Don't leave it to chance. You have this amazing opportunity to be part of uh, boiling some taters, right? Be part of it. It's what God calls us to do. Amen.